Have you ever wanted to shoot space aliens on a 96 by 80 pixel grid the size of a 4K television? I thought so too, but I did it anyway. Let's take a look at this project today at the Geekery Annex. The first time I thought about making something like this was after seeing a set of videos on BitLooney's channel that led up to a modular panel in the year 2020 with 1920 pixels diffused by ping pong balls. I started working on my own project a year later, looking for something much less complex and with much closer pixel spacing. Also, I wanted something I could do with limited tools and limited space in which to work. I first started experimenting with how to diffuse individual LEDs, starting with a white Lego tile. However, needing to remove the structure on the back of the piece to avoid shadows, the amount of dimming, and not being able to get a good shade of white were all negatives to this approach. I did verify that a ping pong ball does diffuse the light very nicely, but with even more dimming and making a very large and non-square pixel. Interestingly, white duct tape gives good diffusion and a good white color. When I put together a small grid of LEDs, it was even more clear that the LEGO idea wouldn't work without significant modifications. Making a grid of holes in a piece of wood with LEGO on top was interesting, but the whole thing seemed rather impractical. What about an actual grid with LEGO on top? Not bad. This was just a simple grid made of cardboard pieces, but it does a nice job of keeping the light from each LED from leaking onto adjacent LEGO tiles. Since the duct tape diffuser worked surprisingly well, I thought I would try a duct tape array. It actually looks pretty good, but it would be very fiddly to make it work because any seam between pieces of tape would be very obvious. They make plastic grids to separate sections of a fish tank, which I looked at as a possibility, but there were going to be some issues with making a larger grid, and of course I would have to individually place each LED to match the grid size, while at the same time the grid size did not exactly match Lego size. This is where I want to point out that I didn't have a 3D printer, and in any case printing out a grid for thousands of LEDs would be quite an undertaking. Maybe for a later version. With a better idea of how I might want things to look, I then upgraded to strips of individually addressable 5 volt WS2812B LEDs. Eventually I put together a full 16x16 16 16 pixel array using these strips, the fish tank grid, and a sheet of acrylic as a diffuser. Looks nice, but you can see the extra thick line of the grid where two pieces join together and you get a double thickness boundary. But this still was at least a very good proof of concept. I bought a bunch more strings of LEDs and tested them out. I looked around some more and found a 4 foot by 2 foot louver grid for an overhead light at the local home improvement store and bought a big sheet of black acrylic online to provide the black panel for the LEDs in the grid. Acrylic provides a nice smooth surface that takes tape well. I marked off where the LED strips needed to go based on the louver, which are hard to see on the acrylic. Then began the laborious process of cutting the strings into shorter strips and sticking them to the acrylic. This was even more difficult because of the spacing of the LEDs was a bit longer than the grid size. I had to lay down strips of a few LEDs and cut out the middle section of the traces in between the last pixel on one strip and the first pixel on the next strip. This effectively shortens the LED strip and keeps the LEDs more or less lined up with the grid. You can see where I have taken a chunk out of the lead traces and will need to solder those back together. And that gave me my first LED grid, 48 by 36 pixels. With the light being diffused, each LED doesn't have to be perfectly centered, and you can see the variability in the spacing if you look closely. Of course I had to do all the solder joints within the lines of LEDs and all the power and data connections between each line. I used an ESP32 microcontroller to control the LEDs and I finally got the entire grid to light up. There was an issue with using the fast LED library, so I used the ESP32 digital RGB LED drivers. This cleverly uses the RMT, or Remote Control Transceiver feature, of the ESP32 to send the appropriate digital signals to the controller on each LED pixel. Here's a more interesting pattern running at about 60 to 70 frames per second. Then a check that I'm converting pixel grid location to the appropriate string of LEDs by calculating and drawing a bunch of straight lines. Keep in mind that since the data signals run through every pixel in sequence and the LEDs zigzag back and forth from row to row, you have to do this conversion yourself in code or match a pattern defined in a software library. 
I thought a good test of the grid would be to write a clone of Space Invaders designed off the Atari 2600 version, seen here running in automatic fire mode with no alien missiles, but otherwise the game mechanics and scoring are in place. Back to the grid and light diffusion. I tried out an actual plastic diffusing film to cover the entire grid without seams. This revealed one of the problems with a white grid, which is light bleed between pixels. Spray painting the grid black made it look way better, and it looked even better in person than here on the video camera. But, I wanted something with more pixels. You could see that the aliens were only 3x3 pixels, and even then I could only fit 30 of them on the screen as opposed to 36 in the Atari 2600 version, and 55 in the original arcade version. That's when I decided to forget about the grid and light diffusion for a while, and just make a display using a large array of 16x16 LED sheets, which were and are widely available. These sheets take care of the zigzagging wiring pattern for you, and just require one input and one output for data, and one input for power. It wasn't too hard at this point to get a pair of them working together. The ESP32 microcontroller has eight channels of RMT. I decided to try a 5x4 grid of LED panels with six channels of three panels, or 768 pixels, and a seventh channel with just two panels, or 512 pixels. This gives 80 by 64 pixels. I needed to be very careful to get them chained together properly, so I put together a map of the panels, and also printed out a mere reverse copy to match what I would see when wiring from the back. For this version, I decided to run a separate power line to each panel, giving me this Cthulhu-looking assembly coming off of the power supply. For both this test setup and for the actual build, I used bullet connectors for the data lines between the panels and for power. For a prototype, it's generally best to use as few permanent connections as possible to allow for easier modifications. I used double-sided tape to attach the panels to the acrylic sheet, and one disadvantage is that it's hard to get them perfectly lined up. These aren't too bad, but one can clearly see the misalignments between the sheets. Once the LED panels were all in place, I could complete the rat's nest of wires for power and data. The blue connecting wires run between multiple panels on the same ESP32 channel, and the unconnected bullet sockets run each channel to the ESP32. I put pieces of tape on all the power leads so I could number them and make sure to match the proper length lead to each panel, with those same numbers being written on the plywood to keep things straight. And now to light up all seven channels. Or not. It took some debugging to get everything working. Let's try again. Eh, getting closer. I had to swap out a malfunctioning panel and correct another connection. Here we go. All seven channels and 20 panels working. That's when a big problem became obvious, which is that different batches of LED panels have brightness and color variations. I was hoping that I could adjust the brightness and color settings for each panel so that they would match, but it just didn't work. Thus ended version 2 of the LED wall. Might as well go big, so I started working on a 6x5 grid of panels. I wanted to have spares, so I bought 40 of the panels all at once from one seller direct from China. For reference, these were about $10 a piece back in 2021. Of course, I needed to test each one of them. Once I got my test rig put together, it took less than 20 minutes to unbag all the panels and test them. And they all worked. Plus, indeed, the light output was essentially identical on all panels. I wanted a more sophisticated and modular design for attaching the panels to the backer board. There are six groups of four panels and two groups of three panels. I bought 12 inch by 12 inch sheets of acrylic, so four panels will fit on one sheet with the panels overhanging a bit. I marked out the locations of the center of each panel and drilled partway through the acrylic to have room for a T-nut. I needed to drill holes to route the power and data cables through the back, and I drew guidelines to position the LED panels on the acrylic as precisely as possible. By drilling a hole in the plywood backer matching the location of the T-nut, I could use a machine screw and a large fender washer to make the attachment, and the holes are big enough to be able to adjust each 2x2 group of panels so they align well with other groups of panels. 
That leaves the backing board looking like this with all the holes for power, data, and the screws in place. I did these pretty much freehand because they don't need to be precisely located. Obviously with a CNC machine one could make these look better. One of the other problems I was having was interference between different data channels. One can solve this with shielded cables, and I decided to specifically go with coaxial cables designed for RF signals. This is a more expensive way to go, but I also like the fact that the cables can be rerouted easily if necessary. That meant I had to desolder the cables off the back of each LED panel and solder on SMA type coaxial sockets for data. One leg of the socket connects to ground, and the center connects to data. I used double sided carpet tape to attach the LED panels to the acrylic. Only needing a 2x2 two two grid of panels to be in co alignment at one time makes this easier than it was for the 5x4 grid of version 2. Note that the two channels with 1x3 grids were made in a similar manner. Once all the panels are screwed into place, we have the 6x5 grid, which is 96x80 or 7,680 total pixels. Here's the back of the panel where we need to run power leads and route the data signals to each channel and in between panels of each channel. Here we see the coax routed as well as the ground lines. Each channel has their power tied together with the power and ground running to the power supply. For testing I set up coaxial connections to the appropriate pins of the ESP32 on a breadboard. And now all wires are hooked up and we are ready for testing. Once I did as much testing as I could, it was time to put the coaxial sockets on perf board and the whole thing in a project box. Finally we're done. Let's fire it all up. Okay, I had to go back and do a better job with some of the wiring. In part this was because it is rather fiddly getting the coax sockets soldered to the LED panels. Okay, we're doing better. Ta-da! After seeing versions 2 and 3 of the array without any grid or diffusion, I was kind of liking the look of the bare LED pixels. This also has the advantage of being able to run the pixels at a much dimmer setting, and thus needing much less current and avoiding overheating. All 7680 pixels running full blast would draw more than 400 DC amps and 2 kilowatts of power. Allowing for AC to DC power losses and a bit of a buffer, this would use up most of a 20 amp 120 volt AC line into the room where this would be located. Running them at low power takes care of this issue. Unfortunately I did run into what may be an insurmountable problem. When refreshing each channel of pixels, you have to send the signals for all LEDs in sequence. This takes time, and there are speed limits on the RMT system. I've been having trouble getting even 30 frames per second. With 1024 pixels controlled on the largest channels, it just takes too long to refresh. I'm not sure if that's strictly due to the number of pixels per channel or just the total number of pixels, and I need to do some more testing. For most applications, I would like to be able to throttle the speed at exactly 30 or 60 frames during each second. So, the next step is to look at ways to make the LED wall faster, such as coordinating multiple ESP32s or upgrading to a TNC 4.0 microcontroller. I think there are other ways, but I'm not a programmer, let alone a software developer, so I'm trying to find the easiest way to do this. Since I last did any serious work on this project, I bought a house and now have a garage workshop with much better power tools, so I'm also considering redesigning the wall and making it even bigger. But, that will be for another video from the Geekery Annex.